So the question I have to you today is this. I have a beaker in my hand. What is the volume of this beaker? How much water could it contain? How could you figure that out? You could pour water into it. And then and then what? Okay, so you so you propose filling it up or weighing it empty and then weighing it full. And then use the density of water and you could figure out um, the volume. Agree? Would that be pretty accurate? How accurate would it be? Depends on the scale. Depends on your scale, right? Because you could you could probably well the only thing you're actually What's the only data point you're actually collecting via that method? A change in weight, agree? Which you turn into a change in mass, which you can then use an assumption about the density, because are you actually measuring the density? No. No. Ooh. You're not measuring the density. You're assuming the density is how much? One. One gram per milliliter, right? Or one gram per cubic centimeter, but what if the density is not one gram? What's it? What if it's a one point oh oh one gram per cubic centimeter? And oh, you're assuming that we have we don't have a scale that can measure that precisely. I bet you we do. I bet you we've got a scale that can measure down to point oh oh one grams. So, yeah, so how would you get the density of this? What's that? Do the mass versus volume. So, so you take a bunch of mass and volume data of your water that you're using to get the density of the water. What if you're too lazy to do that? What if you have a bottle of pure, super pure deionized water that you went next door to chemistry to get. And you know there's, according to its conductivity analysis, there is nothing in that other than water. It's got, we've got a thingy on the thing that, that says that, that there's, there's nothing else in the water other than water. Because if there were something else in the water other than water, it would, the conductivity would shoot through the roof. But what if that had an error? Well, I will say that if that has an error, then you've got a, a major problem with the equipment, right? You, at some point, you have to trust the equipment, right? You're not, is, let me ask you this, does, how much, hmm, let's say you know that the water's pure because the conductivity is, uh, 1 times 10 to the, I'm just making up number, 1 times 10 to the negative 8th, right? And you put 1 grain of salt in it, what does it do to the conductivity? Increases by a factor of a billion. Yeah. So, yeah, that 1 grain of salt, how much is that going to affect the density? Not that much. How much is it going to affect the conductivity? hugely. So you can rest assured that as long as that conductivity sensor is working, that's pretty pure water. Okay, so we got pure water. All right, we got pure water. But we know that the density of pure water can vary how come? Temperature. So what if you looked up online a graph of density versus temperature for pure water? What's that? I would know that there's... <laughs> I think that's the point. That, yeah, I mean, you got to assume that somebody's done, you know, done their due diligence there, right? And you look up a graph, and you could correct for temperature. Wouldn't you agree? So, but what, what would you have to measure? The temperature. The temperature, right? You'd have to measure the temperature of the water to correct for the density. 
Does that make sense? And, and there are data tables, and people have done this. And you could, uh, did you know that if you uh, heat up water, it expands? Yeah. That was on the back of our Right? So. You found Carla. Yeah. She's at the door. Oh, hold on. How many people are convinced that Macy's method could give us a pretty darn accurate assessment of how much water is in here? Me too. I think that's, the, that's a great way to do it. Now, what if I said, I'm not going to give you any water, but I'm going to give you a meter stick? Here. Thank you. How much water can that hold? <coughs> meter stick? Figure it out. That looks good. Yeah. You would find the radius. Oh, uh, you could find the radius. Height. And the height. And how would you calculate how much water it could hold? But but the but the volume markers don't go all the way up to the tippy top. The volume markers only go to here, but you can put more water in there. Hard at an angle. Everybody's very top. Okay. Shh. There's too much chaos going in. Um. <laughs> Hassan says you should integrate. No, that's right. So we don't know anything about the beaker, but we're going to integrate. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what's the method that, that uh, James is using right now? Just Mathematical. Base times height gives you volume, right? Okay, so here's the question. What's, what's wrong with doing it that way? Or maybe not wrong, but what's imprecise about doing it that way? Yeah. Beaker's not a perfect cylinder. How so? The bottom's like that, and the top's So you're saying the bottom has a little bit of a of a of a bevel in it, yeah. right? A bit, a little bit of a curve, and and the outside flare out. And the top is has got a little bit of a chamfer, a little bit of a flare out. Yes. And also the thickness of the glass. You don't get a right height. Right uh, height. Okay, so it's difficult to measure the height based on because there's some weird optics like light bending going on. So it's really hard to see where the bottom of the glass is, maybe. Right? What else? Water is cohesive. Uh, how to, oh, so you're, you're saying the water is going to form a meniscus? Yeah, it could. Okay. The ruler is hard The ruler is hard to measure. What do you mean? No, I'm not saying he's wrong, but what do you mean? You can't really accurately read a number off this. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. So rather than just saying big fuzzy terminology, you can't really accurately use Sure you can. Depends on what you call accurate or what you call precise, right? For example, if I wanted to measure the length of this remote control, how would I do it? Here, you do it. You can tell me what the length of that remote control is with, the, with this meter stick. Okay, so he's aligning it up with, with the 10 centimeter mark so he can see a clean line, which I like that. And then he's going all the way to... 12.1? So he's saying... 12.05. It's definitely 12 centimeters. 12.05. And then you got like a little bit of a millimeter mark going on, right? So you're saying like half a millimeter beyond 12? Yeah. So what's the precision of this meter stick? 0.0. Can you go to the nearest millimeter? Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Can you go to, can you guess at some number beyond the nearest millimeter? One number beyond. Maybe. Guess. It's kind of hard though because the paint lines on here are kind of fuzzy. So, but you can make a guess, but you're, you can be pretty confident about the millimeter. So you can be pretty confident down to the point zero. Oh, oh, 001 meters. Anything beyond that is really pretty fuzzy. That makes sense? Okay, so you're saying that this meter stick has the ability to measure down to one millimeter. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, so 
the accuracy, or the, rather the precision that you're going to get from this meter stick should be down to the millimeter. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Okay, so what I want, Dino, what I want you to do is I want you to measure the width of James's head. Go. <laughs> Of his head. Yes, his head. Don't forget about the hair. Oh, no, I just want to know the width of his head. Just, just tell me. Oh, no, not including the ears. Just, 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 just the fuzzy part. No, no, make it easy for him. Come on. Sixteen centimeters. Wait, wait, wait. No, didn't we say that meter stick can measure down to the millimeter? And and if you're really good, uh, sub millimeter. Yeah, okay, give me give me a measurement. Wait, no, no, no. Are you confident? Do it again. Sixteen point five. Sixteen point. Wait, I thought you said sixteen point two centimeters before. Wait, wait, wait. Shh. Hassan, you're next. Come on up here. <laughs> He's going to integrate James said. Um, so Dino, Dino couldn't make up his mind, so I would like you to resolve conflict. He said 16.2 centimeters, and then he said 16.5, but this thing should be able to measure down to sub-millimeter accuracy. Go, measure the width of his head. Oh, God. oh, that's a very political answer. <laughs> All right, Macy, come on up. I want to know the width of James's head. You sure don't want to tell that I think your head's changing no. size. <laughs> it depends on how much knowledge is packed in. <laughs> Move the ruler, not my head. <laughs> okay, so what does Macy say? Macy says... It, Macy says it's difficult. I agree. Has everyone measured from the same spot on his head? I feel like it's more than 16, so like 17. 17 something. Okay, listen up. Shh. What's the issue here? Why did every person, and, and even Dino, when he measured twice, came up with two different numbers that were clearly not down to the nearest millimeter? Or rather, he reported to the nearest millimeter, but then he did it again, and he got a completely different number of millimeters. What's, what's the issue here? It's fuzzy. It's fuzzy. It's fuzzy. In fact, you're trying to measure something fuzzy with something that is inherently more precise than the fuzziness. Right? Isn't that an issue? So, yeah, we say the meter stick is capable of de measuring down to the mi nearest millimeter maybe better, but the object you're measuring might not be measurable down to that level of precision. Do you see the issue? Yeah. So every time you make a measurement, you're making a judgment call. All right? It's not always appropriate to measure down to the instrument accuracy or rather the instrument precision. The instrument might tell you more digits than you're really capable of measuring in that particular system because depending on how the wind is blowing his hair might move just a little bit right and then his width changed and that has nothing to do with the meter stick. Do you understand the issue? Yes. So what do you report when you report a measurement? Depends on what measurement. You report a number, right? Is that it? You, you, uh, you report a tolerance with that? You report a tolerance. So, so what was the smallest number we came up with in terms of measuring his head? 16.2. What was the biggest number? 17. Seven, was it straight 17 or 17? 17. 17. You want to make it easy? Call it 17.2? Sure. Okay. So let's say we measured it four times and we said that 
Uh, James's head is somewhere between 16.2 and 17.2 centimeters, depending on the time of day and the wind and w whether or not he's wearing a hat. Right? And if he shaved. And if he shaved. Well, if he changed, then all bets are off because then he'd lose <laughs> millimeters off of either side. So 16.2 to 17.2 centimeters, or 0.162 to 0.172 meters, and that would be appropriate way to report it. But a lot of times we want to know just one number. So what would you what would you say? Halfway. Halfway point. Okay. Or you could take all the numbers and add them up, divide by four, and get a get a get a mean. Or you could, you know, there's a, you, you could calculate a median. Do you guys know how to do a median? Yeah. It's, it's like the, if you do like 50 numbers, 25 will be above that and 25 will be below that. 25 of the measurements will be above and 25 below. Okay, so there's different ways to do it. But what we do is we say, however you want to do that average, then you say plus some value and minus some value. So what do you want to call the average? 16.7, that sounds reasonable. Plus how much, minus how much? <clears throat> Plus or minus 0.5. Plus or minus 0.5 centimeters. And that is how you would report an error. All right? Does that make sense? Do you see why this is better than sig figs? It provides a lot more information than sig figs. It provides information on what you think the best number is and what you think the reasonable spread of numbers is. Does that make sense? Yes. So we can add, like, get rid of the outliers? Yeah, and again, that's a judgment call. If you did a measurement and, like, the wind was blowing and it really affected everything and it became an outlier, would you include it or would you not include it? I mean, what do you think? Not. Not? Okay, it's up to you. And that's the thing. Science is a judgment call. When you're doing this science and you're collecting this data, you are making a judgment of what is good and what is bad data. All right? And if it's bad data, what do you got to do? Just ignore it and just carry on with your life? No, you got to figure out why. It's figure out why it's bad and what are you going to do? Try to fix it. No, you don't do error analysis with bad data. Correct. You redo your experiment. You rework things so you don't have the bad data. Does it make sense? Yeah, do not waste your time doing error analysis with a bunch of stuff that you know is bad. All right. Okay, so um, as far as error goes, there's a couple different kinds of errors. Um, well, first of all, let's talk about true value. True value. What's the true value of James's head? The width, the width. Uh, sorry, not the true value of his head. The width of his head. You don't know. We can't know. Because even if we could measure from the edge of that hair to the edge of that hair with the scanning electron micrograph, even though it won't really measure, there's still an instrument precision issue with an electron micro micrograph. How accurate are those things? Will they tell you down to uh, the nearest, uh, nearest uh, angstrom? No. In fact, an SEM machine will only go down to about 10 nanometers. Beyond that, you're just guessing. Right? That's really good compared to our... Yeah, it's way better than a meter stick, but it's still not perfect. Yes. Well, it depends on how good is good enough, right? But the point is, you can't ever know the quote-unquote true value of anything. Or, you, or at least you can't measure it. All, the best you can do, and what we do do, is say this is what we think our best guess at the value is, and this is what we think our error is. Good? Yeah. All right. So... Two types of errors. There's indeterminate and there's systematic. Indeterminate errors. What's the, well, what's the difference between those two?
indeterminate versus systematic? Indeterminate. Uh, okay, let's do it this way. Let's say my meter stick was mismarked. Would that introduce a systematic error or an indeterminate error? Systematic error. Systematic error. Let's say my meter stick, the spacing was too short for the millimeter marks. Yeah, what kind of error would it introduce? What would it do? Systematic. It would always be all off your by measures the would same. Be short. Would all be the measurements would be higher than the actual, right? Okay, so that would be a systematic error. And as you collected a bunch of data, would taking a bunch of data average out a systematic error? Yes. No. No. I mean, like, every instance. So, say, say all of these millimeter marks were too close together. And I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to get rid of all my error by taking 50 oh, measurements. No. Is my error going to go away? No. 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 Why not? It's, I'm, it's, I'm always going to be off, right? That's an example of a systematic error, all right? Systematic errors always bias your observation in one direction or another. Then there are random errors or indeterminate errors. Like the wind. Wind, oh, that's interesting. Would wind be... Uh, uh, systematic or would it be indeterminate or random? Does it? It can change. What if there's always a fan right there? Your location. You change locations. Right? You have to be careful about whether it's random and whether it's truly random or it just appears random. If you're outside, then. If you're outside. I would argue that the prevailing winds always blow, or on average, over the course of the year, blow a certain direction. They, on average, they blow from west to east. But if you're like behind the building, is compared to another field, or if you have a breeze? Right. You have to be careful about this, though. You have to look at each data point that you collected and think about that. All right. Is it random or is it systematic? What's your goal with your instrumentation? Your goal with your instrumentation is to reduce that systematic error, right? Perfect instrumentation doesn't exist, but if it did, there would be no systematic error, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. At the beginning of the lecture, I asked you, or asked James, to figure out the volume of this beaker with a meter stick. All right. So if he wanted to figure out the volume of this beaker with a meter stick, how would he do it? Base times height, right? Base times height. Well, what's the issue with that if you look at the beaker? It's curved. It's got curves to it. So, James, what I want you to do is I'm going to scroll down we have a blank spot on the page. We do not have a blank spot on the page. I wonder if I can make this smaller. Hold on. Let's move it over to the side. All right. So, James, what I want you to do is I want you to measure the radius of that beaker. And James is going to measure the radius of the beaker, but I want everybody to write it down. So, radius of the beaker. What I want you to... Do you know how to report the radius? When I ask you about the radius, what are you going to tell me? An answer in centimeters. Is that enough? Or is there some uncertainty involved? There's some uncertainty. Okay, so I want to know the your best guess plus your uncertainty. Go. Okay, so James, what do you have for a radius? I want to say... Uncertainty 
Uncertainty is tolerance, yeah. Plus and minus one the plus, plus and minus, yeah. The radius changes, this is not fair. Um, exactly, the radius <laughs> changes, it's not fair. So make a make a judgment call. Everybody's waiting. I feel like like whenever you say make a judgment call, I just picture it like you're like the radius gets bigger, so it doesn't build like, in like some like, if you measure from yeah, the bottom. Yeah, that's right. Radius, like, smaller, if you measure it from the bottom, the radius will get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, he's doing this right now, but everybody's going to get a beaker and get a chance to do this in a few minutes. I want to say 7.3 divided by 2. Seven, what's 7.3 divided by 2? 3.65. 3.65. So 3.65. 3.65 centimeters. Plus or minus how much? <laughs> Point two. Point two centimeters. About that, yeah. Point two, so two millimeters. Okay. So plus or minus point two centimeters. Yeah. Okay. All right. So three point six size. Oh, uh, do we want centimeters or meters? Are we okay doing this in centimeters? Yeah. Okay. Well, I am too. I all right, um, okay, we need a, a height. Right? To the top of the beaker? Well, to the point where water would start coming out. Six plus one, oh, eight, 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 point one. All right. Ten point six centimeters plus or minus how much? Point one centimeters. Interesting. That one you reported is more precise. Yes. Hmm. Okay. All right. So the question I have is, what's the volume of this beaker? So what's the what's the equation for volume? V equals pi r squared h. Okay, give me a number. Four hundred and forty three cubic centimeters. Oh, how many digits is it appropriate to report? Three. That'd be appropriate to report three digits, right? Oh, so it's really four hundred forty four? No. Uh oh, if you round, yeah. Right. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> 444 cubic centimeters? Wait, okay. No, there's a range. Yeah. There's right. A range. Wait. Oh, boy. Uh, how do we account for the range? I want to know the best guess, and I want to know the range, right? Here's my best guess. 444 centimeters, what's that based on? That's based on a radius of that and a height of that. But I want to know plus how much and minus how much. How do you do the plus and minus? You use the two highest. Okay, so idea to do the, the, the minimum value and the maximum value is to compute based on the minimum radius and the minimum height and the maximum radius and the maximum height. And if you did that, you would have a range. Agree? Yes. However, that range is, in fact, an overestimate. That is an overestimate. You could do that, but we typically don't because the statistics say that that is too loose of a range, too broad of a range. So, 
if you want a better estimate of like 95 or 99 percent or whatever, here's the accepted way to do this. All right, I'm going to move this over again so you can see it again. All right. There are rules, and the way the rules work is this. <laughs> Sum and difference rule. We add absolute errors. Product and quotient rule, we add relative errors. So, anytime you're adding or subtracting two numbers in an equation, you add the absolute error. Anytime you're multiplying or dividing numbers, you add the percent error. Okay, so the question I have for you is back to this question. When we calculated volume, did we do it by adding or multiplying? Multiplying. So if we want to multiply two numbers, do we want to add their absolute errors or add their percent errors? Percent errors. So we need to convert that radius error number into a percentage. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. What's 0.2 centimeters as a percent of 3.65? Add percent, percent error, yeah. 5.4 5 what? 5.479%. Point 0.2 is 5% of 3.65. Oh, yeah, it is. Never mind. <laughs> 5. Point how much? 5.479. 5. 5.5%. Good. And what about the error in the height? Point nine four percent. Okay. Now, what do we do with those? If we want to find a total percent error on volume, well, how do we calculate volume? We multiplied pi times r times r times h, right? So, what's the error in the number pi? No. Nothing. That's an exact number. What's the error in the number in the radius? Five point five. How many times are you multiplying the radius? Twice. So we would have to add the percent error twice, right? So, percent. Error in volume percent error would equal 5.5% plus 5.5% plus, and the error in the height? 0.94% is a total of how many percent? Eleven point twelve percent. Okay. So we are pretty darn confident that the volume of this beaker is four hundred and forty four cubic centimeters plus or minus twelve percent. Yeah. I I don't like plus or minus twelve percent though. I want an absolute number. So plus or minus how much? 12% of, of 444, which is how much? So the volume overall would be 444 cubic centimeters plus or minus how much? 53 cubic centimeters. And that is how you do error propagation. Does that make sense? Yes.
Uh, that was over. Uh, it, it called it add the relative errors. Absolute is the number with units. Relative is the number with percent. Yeah. Okay. So does that make sense? Yes. So last thing, and, and th this is kind of the most important detail. Let's say that we wanted to know whether or not our meter stick method was accurate. Now we can do Macy's way. Yeah, what do we do? 400, we, we got 444 plus or minus 53, right? Yeah. No, it doesn't then we fill it with water and we do Macy's way. And let's see, let's compare the two methods. This method was somewhere in this range of 444 plus or minus 53, right? And that was with the meter stick. Wow, that's awful. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you do it the water way. And let's say the water way gives you, um, gives you a very tiny range, right? Gives you something like that. I've got a question. How come when you did the percent error way, it was less <laughs> accurate than just taking the lower values of them? It, it, it narrows your range. No, it actually broadened the range. Oh, did it? Yeah. Oh. I, uh, two centimeters. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't actually run the numbers. Uh, James says that doing it uh, the... Uh, Taking the, the, like, lowest the lowest value and the highest... Bounds. The lower bounds and the upper bounds gave him a broader range. Wait. I'm Wait, no, short, small, short, shorter. Smaller range. Smaller range. Okay, I can go through and explain why this works, but we only have a couple minutes left. Okay. Um, but I can show you a paper on why this way represents a better, okay. gives you better statistical okay. results, statistically. Okay, uh, well, how would you get any errors associated with filling up with water? Uh, are you drop splitting? Right, because... The water goes drop by drop, and there's a, a plus or minus associated with plus or minus half a drop, right? Oh. Right? Because it's going to take a certain number of discrete drops to fill the thing, right? And then each drop has a certain volume to it. So we know that it's got to be uh, at one number of drops, it's going to be full but not overflowing and you put another drop in it's going to overflow so we know that it's got to be within that range of one drop right okay so that's that's i think one of your main sources of error but but wouldn't you agree that that's much more precise than plus or minus 53 centimeters okay so if you had this data via the meter stick method, you got this range, and via the water drop method, you, or the Macy's way, you got this method. Would they agree in this case? Yes. They would agree because this method overlaps completely with that method. What if the meter stick method gave you a range that was above the water method? Would the methods agree? No. No, they would not. What if you had a range of methods that one was like this and one was like this, and they partially overlapped? They would somewhat agree. There's a question. They or you may or may not have confirmed your data or your technique. Does that make sense? So whenever you're doing any sort of lab analysis and you want to know whether or not you did a good job, how do you gauge whether or not you did a good job? Other data. You have to do an experiment twice. Uh, uh, to be more precise than that. What if, okay, so if you have an accepted, you're trying to verify against an accepted value, what should your range be? The accepted value should fall within your range of your data. Okay, good. 
what if you're not trying, there's no, it doesn't make sense to talk about accepted value. What if you're comparing two different methods that you don't, there is no accepted value? Like this case, for example. There is no, we don't know what the true value of the true amount of water this holds, right? But you do it two different ways, and if there's overlap, then you've pretty much confirmed that they match. Does that make sense? So, things that you need to know from today for the lab tomorrow. You need to know how to do this process. And by the way, this is for all future labs. You're going to use this technique. You're going to need to know the difference between a random error and a systematic error. Right? Anytime you talk about error in labs. And for all systematic errors, you need to tell me which way it would skew your results. So say for example, if we looked at this beaker, with the meter stick method, are you underestimating or overestimating? It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. What if you just measured up to a certain spot on the beaker and didn't include the flange on top? Then you're overestimating. 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 Well, if you measure up to the, all the way to the bottom and then all the way to the side, you're overestimating, right? If you just measure to the bottom part of the curve, or to where it starts curving, and to where it starts curving, you're underestimating. And you need to be able to think through that process. It's not always going to be as simple as the volume of a beaker, though. Right? What if you're doing something with forces and your equation is FF equals mu FN? And you want to know FF. So what do you measure? Mu and FN. Those are the two sources of error, right? And you have an error in FN and you have an error in mu. All right? And then you do that error propagation. All right, any questions on how to do this? All right, we'll be in lab tomorrow.